I'll go ahead and get started. Um, our agenda for tonight is a little bit with introductions. We have fishery staff from across the state. We have some park personnel online. We also have some wildlife staff and law enforcement online to help answer any questions. Uh, I'll go over a little bit on Zoom, if you're not familiar with Zoom, on uh, a few of the ground rules there so that we can make this thing move as quickly and smoothly as possible. And then uh, Tony Barretta will take over at that point and cover a little bit of an overview of the fisheries division. And then our district Southeast or Southwest District guys will take over and cover current projects uh, out in their area and also fishing forecast. And then after that, most importantly, we will have a question and answer period. One of the important aspects of these programs are to get your input as anglers into what we're doing and what you'd like to see, what you see when you're out at the lakes, uh, what needs improvement, what you like. It, these feedbacks really help us. Um, we had feedback last year in the one district about a boat ramp needing fixed up. We got it fixed up for this year. Uh, we hit some low water and it worked out great. Uh, we'll be replacing some fish cleaning stations uh, that need to be replaced. Uh, we keep breaking down in certain areas and we're gonna go with a new model of fish cleaning stations. So uh, that'll also be a major improvement that has been uh, some of the complaints as in the past. So we're gonna try and, we'll record everything. As you put things in the chat, please, if it's a comment, put comment first. If it's a question, put question first. That will help Jordan Cott, who's do, gonna moderate the question and answer period. And that would give them uh, an opportunity for him to be able to sort through those a lot easier as we go along. Okay, I think we got things back here. We act a little slow here. I think you're pressing the back button, Dean. There you go. Yep, sure <laughs> was. Thanks, Tony. Okay, this is what I basically went over already. Uh, on Zoom, uh, if you will all put the little red slash by clicking on the mute button so that you remain muted through this process. Also, a slash through the video so that your video is not showing. That helps with the, the speed of the process of the machine. And then the chat button is the one here in the center here. You click on that and it'll bring up a little screen off to your right that you can enter in any comments and stuff. And then if you have trouble, there's a reactions button. It will allow you to raise your hand if you need, you need help with something. And with that, I'll turn it over to Tony. I, I screwed it up, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. A little bit of technical difficulties here, but Brad. Brad, Brad will get be an the, expert at this. By the time we're done. There we go. Okay, we're back up and rolling here. Um, so as, uh, as Dean mentioned, I'm gonna go over kind of an overview of our fisheries division. My name's Tony Barrett. I'm an assistant division administrator with our fisheries division, fisheries management section. And um, the, the one thing we wanted to hit on right off the bat is just how our, how our fisheries division is funded. And we are primarily uh, user fee based. So that, that includes fishing license sales, um, everybody going out and buying annual 
multi-year uh, lifetime fishing permits helps fund our, our division. We also have a sport fish restoration program. And these are funds distributed to state agencies, uh, state, state game and fish agencies that are collected from excise taxes on fishing tackle, uh, fishing equipment, uh, including boats and, and taxes on motorboat fuel. We have uh, aquatic invasive species fees that help specifically fund our aquatic invasive species program. And that's in the form of resident uh, portion of our resident boater registrations that everyone uh, pays every, every three years, as well as annual non-resident uh, AIS stickers um, that, 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 are, uh, that need to be on non-resident boats. In addition to those uh, base funding sources, we also rely on public and many public and private partnerships and collaborations and other grant opportunities. So our fisheries division structure um, is comprised of three main sections within our division. Our fisheries management, you guys uh, will be hearing specifically from our Southwest district tonight, but we have three other uh, districts within the state. Um, a lot of what the fisheries management guys uh, go out and do is uh, fish population surveys, um, indexing fish populations and habitat conditions at our water bodies um, to uh, help guide and implement different management strategies, whether that's regulation changes, stocking recommendations, um, rehabs, renovations, uh, aquatic habitat enhancement projects, those sort of things. Uh, speaking of aquatic habitat enhancements, we have a, our aquatic habitat program that is housed within our management section. Um, this program is nationally recognized for, for uh, a lot of the work that has been done over the last 20 plus years, um, implementing very large projects, uh, collaborating with a lot of different entities to improve and enhance aquatic habitat and water quality and then in turn our fisheries. We also have angler access and boating access programs within our, within our management section. And uh, we utilize uh, internal funds as well as uh, federal funds from our sport fish uh, dollars to help with uh, access improvements on a lot of our public fishing areas. We have a private water section that we have a uh, biologist devoted to providing technical assistance to uh, private landowners that, that need help and, and recommendations on, on private, private, lake, um, private lake management and, and uh, aquatic habitat management. And then last but not least, we have uh, our aquatic invasive species program within our management section. Um, and like I said before, we, we have a lot of fees or we, we collect fees on, 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 on boater type, uh, type registrations to help fund this program. Um, a lot of different things are, are done within this program, including boater, boater inspections and surveys, um, aquatic invasive species monitoring and such. Our production section is comprised of five hatcheries um, spaced throughout the state. Um, these hatcheries uh, propagate, produce, and distribute a number of different species uh, um, depending on their, their specific systems and capabilities within our, within our facilities. Um, they are, our, our folks in production are continually asked to be innovative as, uh, as requests from, from our management staff and, and the public continue to be very high and a, a large demand for a lot of number of different fish species and di different fish sizes. Um, one of the things that's really been uh, something that we're proud of with this, with this, uh, with this group is our, our recent advancements in, in being able to raise large fish, uh, increase survival. And that's, that's in a lot of different species, including our walleyes. Uh, another timely thing within our production section is our, our seasonal rainbow trout stockings. We have rainbow trout that are gonna be hitting a lot of uh, your area waters here within the next week to a month. 
So uh, be checking our website. Uh, Jordan Cott, our moderator for this section, is going to be posting some some different links um, that will be helpful in you finding these spots where these fish these fish will be going into your public waters. And then our other section is our research section. Within our research section is housed our rivers and streams program um, who conduct surveys and different projects on warm water and cool water streams and rivers. We also have our Missouri River program within our research section. Um, there's a lot of monitoring that's been being conducted with native fish community in the, in the Missouri River. Um, and especially uh, tailored to our federally endangered pallid sturgeon. We also have members of our research team that work very closely with uh, universities, collaborate and contract different research projects with, with our universities. And currently we have projects going on with the University of Nebraska, Lincoln, uh, Kearney and the Nebraska Cooperative Fish and Wildlife Research Unit. We have experts, fisheries, professors, and experts in the field that really help us answer some questions about our fisheries to help guide our management. We have a couple other components within our fisheries division that are very important, and, and one of them is our aquatic education um, program. And Larry Pape, our, our program manager there, does a lot of work with different programs to educate our public on, on fishing, fishing related activities, aquatic education. And he relies heavily on volunteers for this program. We are very, very thankful for everyone that's been, uh, been a volunteer and been helpful in coming out to these programs and helping us conduct these. We couldn't do, um, do the volume of projects and programs without you. And then we have our outreach program um, headed up by Daryl Bauer. Um, he does all kinds of different things to help get information out to you, the anglers, whether that's through blogs um, like Barbs and Backlashes, our fishing, our Nebraska Fishing Facebook page, um, different publications that we put out like our fishing forecast and our fishing guide, all kinds of different things to get information out, out to you. Um, and I'll just put in a plug for our new fishing guide for 2021. We, we made some um, changes to that. And it's, it's very important as we enter the uh, new, new season and likely open water season here very soon that people familiarize themselves with the new regulations that have been put in place for 2021. And then also just familiarize yourself with the, the guide itself as we've made some new formatting changes. And with that, that's, that's the basic overall uh, division structure and how, how, we, uh, how we kind of fun function within our, our uh, fisheries division. And we're going to have Brad delve into more of the specific projects that are going on within the Southeast District. I got it. Okay, thanks, Tony. Appreciate that. Can you hear me? You bet. Okay, thank you. I'm Brad Newcomb. I'm the Southwest District Fisheries uh, District Manager. And uh, we'll talk about where our staff is. I'll introduce them later in the program for questioning. They'll help me answer a lot of questions when we're done with this. Uh, this is an outline of what I'm going to talk about today. And I'm going to start with a slight or a brief description of the Southwest District. Go into project updates, both access and aquatic habitat. Talk about some fish stocking. Uh, give you a fishing forecast for what we think are best opportunities in this district. And then end with some aquatic species information. This is a map of our administrative districts. And the Southwest District is the one I'll be talking about, which is in yellow or orange or toward the bottom. It does show our district office, which is in North Platte. And we have a service center also in Kearney, Nebraska. This is a cutout of that very district. And we do have two fisheries management staff in Kearney. We have three at the North Platte office, and we have one at Ogallala. We also have two fisheries uh, 
fish hatcheries in the state, one at North Platte and one at Rock Creek. Tony mentioned both of those earlier. So we have a fair presence of fisheries staff in this district. This is just an overview of some of the major water bodies we have in our district. Uh, the largest being Lake McConaughey, clear to the left side over there. You can see it. It's about 30,000 acres. We also have one of the second or third biggest reservoirs in the state in Harlan Reservoir, which is about 13,000 acres. Uh, Sherman Reservoir up in our north corner uh, with the four southwest reservoirs make up quite a bit of water. We also have quite a few reservoirs in the Platte Valley. Um, back when we did a strategic plan for some of our reservoirs, we identified that this district contained 80% of Nebraska's surface water acres. So we do have a lot of water in the state that people fish on. This map just shows the game and parks presence in this district. All those yellow circles of the black dot are wildlife management areas. We have nearly 100 of those in this district. The green squares with a, with a camp a tent located on it are the state rec areas or state historical parks. We have about 30 of those. So Game of Parks has a big presence in this district. And I think it goes back to a lot of the water resources we have in this district. A lot of those are located on some of those waters. Okay, now I'll shift gears a little bit and go into some project updates. These are just some aerial photos of some projects we've completed in the past. Um, I'll start with a project history. From 1990 to 2019, we completed 34 projects in this district. If you look at the map, the red circles are all access, angler access, boating access projects. The green triangles are habitat, aquatic habitat projects. A lot of times they include access as well. But you can see we have a pretty good distribution across the district and we've completed quite a few projects so far. To some current or future projects. One of the biggest we got coming up is Lake McConaughey Angler Access. We've got major upgrades coming to Martin Bay and Cedar View, uh, boating access areas that people use quite often out there. Uh, there's a list of features on the right side that shows some of the things that will be going into Martin Bay with a new boat ramp, new boat dock, new parking, area lighting, a fit, new fish cleaning station, restrooms, and the entrance booth. Uh, quite a bit of uh, things going on at Martin Bay. This is about a $4 million project, including the entrance booth, if you include both sites. And this will cause some inconvenience for people using the reservoir in 2021. Martin Bay will be closed most of the recreational season uh, for its construction work. We will open the low water boat ramp uh, as conditions allow. And Cedar View has a shorter time frame. It should be only closed 40 to 60 days. We're going to try to make those days after July 4th to maintain some access to some pretty good walleye fishing up there in the Cedar View area. Some aerial photos of those two locations, Martin Bay on the left, Cedar View on the right. Both very popular access areas depending on the time of the year. Like I mentioned, Cedar View is very popular in May and June. You can see quite a few boats located outside that access when this photo was taken. While we're on Lake McConaughey, I'm going to mention some highlights from the fishing there last year. Uh, we have a Master Angler Walleye program, which any fish caught over 8 pounds or 28 inches qualifies for a Master Angler Award. And the top 12 Master Angler Walleye listed by weight were from Lake McConaughey last year. So, and the largest was 14 pounds, four ounces. So definitely a, a destination site for bigger walleye. Of the 97 statewide master anglers we had last year, 51 were from McConaughey, over half. So again, an indication how good walleye, bigger walleye fishing is at Lake McConaughey. We also had the state record wiper caught last year at McConaughey, the 21 pound, nine ounce fish, 36 inches long. It broke a long-standing record that had been from Red Willow for quite a few years. So uh, a good destination for bigger fish. The last two bullets here show white bass. Again, about half the white bass Master Angler Awards came from McConaughey, close to that anyway. And we're seeing an uptick in our smallmouth bass Master Angler Awards, which is 
a neat thing we're seeing. I think more people are targeting them and another neat fishery that, that, that McConaughey supports. We'll stick with McConaughey for one more slide. We have some fisheries research projects going on out there. The first bullet shows that we're trying to assess the contribution of stocked fish to each year class. And looking at the years from 2015 to 2019, stocked walleye made up about 90 to 100% of those uh, age zero or young of the year fish. So stocking's making, making up a huge contribution of the walleye year classes at McConaughey. And we can tell this by marking all these fish as fried and we look at them later and we can tell if they were marked or not. With white bass, approximately the same time frame, stocking fish, Stocked fish didn't make up near the contribution, 7 to 40 per, 70 to 7 to 40 percent. And we do have some natural recruitment going on with white bass. And the last two, the next slide shows that we are looking for those spawning origins. And once located, I think we'll make efforts to improve or enhance those efforts to improve natural recruitment of white bass when possible. And the last thing we're looking at there with the third bullet is we're looking to improve the stocking survival of both those species um, where they're stocked. And that's based on the presence of predators, available zooplankton or food, turbidity, bank slope, and hopefully we'll come up with best solutions to improve the survival of those fish as well. Moving to Harlan Reservoir. We have a cove restoration project scheduled for later this year, I hope. It's, uh, it's been a long process with uh, mostly Corps of Engineers funding in cooperation with us. Uh, this is Methodist Cove on the left. It shows this cove at high water. And you can see it does connect to the main reservoir, does have some turbid influence from the inflow at that picture. On the right, you'll see the same cove at low water levels. And there's quite a disconnect from the main reservoir to the, to the cove at, at this water level anyway. And what we want to do in this schematic, which is kind of hard to see, but basically we want to make that connection to the cove, to the reservoir, more available at many more elevations. And certainly maybe not up to full out or to real low elevations, but quite a few more and make that a better habitat for a lot of our cove habitat species. This note up on top is, like I mentioned, this is Corps of Engineer funding. It's called 1135 Project. We've been about two years in the planning phase, but we're hoping to see this go to the construction, bidding and construction phase later this year. While we're talking at Harlan, I'll bring up some fish attractor structures we've been using. These are the Georgia cubes that most people have heard about by now. They're basically a PVC and corrugated plastic pipe structure that are easy to build, easy to move, easy to, to deploy. So, they're a lot easier to deal with than cedar trees, which we've done many times in the past as well. At Harlan, we placed these structures in, in two different years. 2018, we placed them in this location at Hunter Cove. We do have coordinates for that. We do have coordinates of the ones they placed at 2020, and some of those are on the south side of the lake at Patterson Harbor, near Patterson Harbor, and the south end of the dam. And we've used these structures in other locations in the state. So Feel free to ask us questions about where some of these are and how they work so far. Moving to Sherman Reservoir. Uh, we have quite a bit going on there as well. Back in uh, early this year, early last year, 2020, we had new boat docks installed in Marina and Thunder Bays, the main two boat access locations. And the picture there to the right is an example of one of those at Thunder Bay. Uh, we do have plans also to look at new dock and and uh, ramp facilities at Trail 10. And hopefully that'll happen in the near future. We also have some new clean fish cleaning stations scheduled for Sherman Reservoir. We might get one or two this year. We're not quite sure. It, it's in the planning phase yet. They'll either go to Marina or Thunder Bays or both. And these cleaning stations will be the new rotary grinder design. Uh, I don't know if you've watched some of the previous projects. They've talked about those a little bit. But basically, we've got these in about three locations in the state so far, and they're virtually maintenance free, whereas our old disposal type units have given our parks people a lot of headaches with being plugged, broken, uh, downtime a lot for anglers, and hopefully we'll get some of these in installed and have far fewer, fewer problems. 
The third bullet shows wave attenuation structure. This structure pictured over here is at the mouth of the Marina Bay. It's been a very popular uh, structure since we put that in about 20 years ago, but in 2019, we had to take that out for some repairs. It was out for a few months and all the repairs were made. It was reinstalled in 2020. So now it's providing good wave protection to that whole Marina Bay and all the infrastructure there, which many people enjoy. We did a, a large aquatic habitat project in Sherman back in the mid 2000s, it's been quite a while now. And some of the structures we put in are showing some erosion problems. This is a breakwater structure at this bottom picture that's showing some erosion problems and we have repairs planned for 2021 to make that a more solid structure. Moving to Elwood Reservoir. Um, late, uh, well, late in 2019, early 2020, the uh, Central Nebraska Public Power and Irrigation who owns and operates that reservoir located a seepage problem near the inlet, pump, inlet pumps, which are located or shown in that picture there. And repairs are ongoing. I guess most are scheduled to be done this fall. So the reservoir currently is quite low. It's about 20 feet low from conservation pool or full pool. Uh, they do plan to partially refill this spring, but during the construction phase, the water levels will go no higher than 10 feet below full pool. So we won't see the reservoir fill up. Um, but it will get quite a bit higher than it is right now. We've got some new boat docks going at various locations across the, the district. Elwood Reservoir and Swanson are two. We've got some others in the works and the plan is not quite complete on those yet. On the left, it shows a picture of the current dock at Elwood Reservoir. It was, it's about 23 years old. I think we, considered, we found out the age of that. And the last few years, we've been having a lot of problems with it. Uh, leaking floats, uh, broken frame structures, quite a few repairs being done and some downtime for anglers. So it's in, in uh, the planning phase to put a new boat dock in there. On the right shows a aluminum gangway, which is basically the structure that leads from the boat dock up to a walkable surface on the ramp or near the ramp. And our, I think we'll be putting quite a few of these aluminum gangways in for two reasons. For one, they have handrails, which makes them safer for people to walk on. Secondly, they're actually lighter than the composite or, or, or uh, plastic gangways. So easier to move and position as well. So we'll be getting a couple things with those aluminum gangways. The last individual project I'll talk about is a pretty big uh, lake renovation project we did in the fall of 2020 at Rock Creek Lake, which is located real near the hatchery, at, at the Rock Creek uh, hatchery down in Dundee County near Parks. And it required that the lake was drawn down. We then renovated the fish population, applying the chemical to kill all the fish. This shows a picture of that process. And after that, the lake was refilled. After, after the lake detoxified, uh, we have began restocking already and we'll continue to do that and that should provide some uh, much improved fishing at Rock Creek Lake in the next three or four years. Kind of a list of some other current projects or future projects that are ongoing in the district. We have a lot going on. I kind of want to make this shorter. So Crystal Lake is kind of the end of a big aquatic rehabilitation project there. We're going to add a viewing deck, picnic shelter and restroom finish that project off. Key West, Buffalhead and Archway Lakes are all lakes near the city of Kearney. They experienced major flooding during 2019 and they did inherit quite a few rough fish species and some of the access to some of those locations was also washed out. So we're in the process of, of repairing both those things. We've done some fish renovations already at Key West and a couple of the Archway Lakes. Some major access improvements need to be made at Key West and Buffalo Head from the damage they received. And that project will be, uh, those projects will be starting pretty soon as well. North Platte and Cozad I-80 Lakes both have some upcoming angler access improvements uh, that will greatly in enhance what's there at those locations right now. Phillips Canyon is a lake downstream of Johnson Lake on the 
Central Nebraska Public Power and Irrigation District Canal System. Many of you are aware of that site. Uh, the, the current site we have there is on a minimum maintenance road. It's very difficult access during certain weather conditions. We are looking at a whole new boat ramp site and that, will, that would be located on central property, but the long-term management will, will be with Game and Parks as a state recreation area. Victoria Springs Lake up near Anselmo is on our, one of our state recreation areas. Uh, we did do aquatic, re, aquatic habitat project on that lake a few years ago, but we're seeing continued problems with water quality, nutrients, excessive vegetation. We are looking at a project to uh, change the inflow and maybe reduce some of those nutrients coming to the lake and improve that project. I will mention that uh, Victoria Springs will be one of the sites for the centennial celebration of our parks division. That will happen in July at Victoria Springs. Uh, in preparation for that, they're doing some capstone improvements, some improvements to the cabins that have been there for many years. Uh, we'll also do some special fish stockings to hopefully offer a few more fishing opportunities for that celebration. Okay. The end of the project for now, we'll talk about fish stocking real quickly. This is one of our fish stocking uh, trailers that you might see running around the state stocking fish. I'll use walleye stocking strategies as kind of an example. We kind of do this with various species, but we stock different sizes of these fish depending where they were. And we've done a lot of research projects, uh, experiments on determining what size of these fish work best at each reservoir and starting with fry on top which are just half inch fish half to one inch fish four to five, five days old when we stock them we stock those at a thousand per acre a lot of fish adds up to a lot these have been the best species that we've determined at harlan reservoir and at a thousand per acre we normally stock 10 to 13 million of those each year at harlan so it's a pretty big number that these fish are very young, they don't take a lot of our hatchery time, and a, a very efficient stocking process if, if they were. We're also trying those on a couple southwest reservoirs to see if we have the same results as Harlan. And so far it looks pretty decent, we'll see how they work. Moving down to the second picture and description here, fingerlings are one to two inch fish. And we see, this is our most common walleye stocking across the state. We usually stock those at 50 per acre, sometimes up to 100 per acre if we uh, determine the need. And some of the major reservoirs in the southwest that we stock with those are McConaughey, Sherman, and most all the Platte Valley reservoirs. Moving to the last category are advanced fish. Those are advanced walleye. I included saw guy here as well. These are eight inch fish. We only stock those at about five per acre because they have a great, a much greater hatchery uh, uh, consumption and, and need, and, and we use quite the minnows to finish these things off, so they're much more expensive. Um, but we are trying these at a couple of our bigger reservoirs, Swanson and Enders, along with some smaller reservoirs such, such as Mormon Island, Sandy Channel, Warax, and Cotton Mill. And so far, they look like they're doing well at all those locations. So we'll continue the experiment and see how those work in the long term. Sawgai are a species we're trying in some more turbid reservoirs. Pioneer Trails is over by Aurora, Nebraska. Hay Center over by Hay Center. And we don't have current survey information to see how well they're doing, but we'll have that very soon. I included this slide to show you a method we're using to help improve stocking survival on most all of our fry and, and quite a few of our fingerlings as well. And that's boat stocking. The hatchery truck arrives with the fish from the hatchery. We tube those into uh, tanks on the boats themselves full of water. And then we take those out to the lake and distribute those at the lake away from predators by the shoreline. And also hopefully places where there's more zooplankton to improve the survival of these fry and, and fingering as well. And we've been doing this for quite a while at some of our lakes and I think it's helping quite a bit. I'll mention our trout stocking that Tony already mentioned. Uh, these will be coming up in the next few weeks in March. And I listed some of the major waters that we stock in our district on the right side there. You can see the top two are state recreation areas and the lake numbers there. 
those windmill and Fort Kearney are both near the city of Kearney, not very far away. You can see most of these others are stockings in or near uh, larger cities, basically, or medium-sized cities. And we do that for a couple of reasons. Um, it provides great access for one, for a lot of people, and, and especially for kids and families. And we want those people to utilize these trout stockings and it works very well. I will mention that all of our fish stocking information is on our website. This left panel is a, an exact copy of a website that, or the website page that comes up when you get to fish stocking. And there is a search box on that page that allows you to search by species, water body, and dates. So you can basically pull up any stocking that we've done in the past from about anywhere and any date and for any species. A good resource for people wanting to get fish stocking information. With that, I'll move into our fishing forecast. Our fishing forecast is a both a print and website publication that's shown here, the cover of this from 2021. It basically includes a lot of graphs for each species. It shows a statewide basis of fish caught. It also includes some text that describes or, and provides more information on those, on those graphs. But basically these graphs show total number of fish for each bar and each bar is divided into colors that shows different size groups for those fish. The information to produce those graphs comes all from our fall surveys or, or our fish population surveys where we use gill nets to sample open water fish species like walleye, channel catfish, white bass, trap nets to sample shoreline species like bluegill, crappie, and yellow perch. And neither one of those net species are very good for collecting largemouth bass, so we use electrofishing boats to collect those. We also use electrofishing to collect some young of the year and, and uh, eight zero fish when we're assessing those in our reservoirs. I'll show you just a few graphs this is a statewide walleye graph. Um, it shows, again, the, the bar height is the total number of fish samples. You can see sample about 30 some walleye at, Willow, at Winters Creek. McConaughey, we sampled just you know, about 33 walleye per net. These yellow bars throughout this graph show all the southwest, all the lakes in our southwest district. They make up about half a lake sampled for walleye last year in the state. And you can also see we go from about top to bottom on numbers and ranges of uh, size ranges of fish. Note that McConaughey certainly is one of our best fish for abundances. And the next slide I'll show shows it's pretty good for size as well. This is just our Southwest District walleye. We pulled those out of that big graph. And again, walleye at McConaughey is certainly the highlight of this graph. This light blue portion of this bar are fish from 20 to 25 inches long and the purple or dark purple are fish over 25 inches. Certainly the best location in the state for fishing for bigger walleye. Elwood also shows a pretty good pit population of larger walleye and quite a few lakes in our district are good walleye fisheries. This is a statewide white bass graph and it's, it's a terrible graph because of one thing. This big bar over here kind of diminishes the rest of the whole graph. But that's the point I wanted to make with this graph. This big red bar, excuse me, this big red bar are all, well, I'll stall back up just a step. About 20 white bass, 10 to 20 white bass per gill net is about normal for a lot of lakes that we sample. Well, this year at Harlan Reservoir, we sampled over 120 white bass per gill net. And most of those were made up of this red bar, which are eight to nine inch, six to nine inch fish. And most of those that we actually sampled were seven to eight. Those fish were all determined to be the 2020 year class or those recruited last year. So they grew to a pretty good size in the fall to be seven to eight inches long. And these will provide what I assume, assume will be excellent white bass fishing for the next few years at Harlem Reservoir. Statewide crappie is this next graph. And I just brought this up to, to highlight two, two major reservoirs. Most of these lakes, if you look at this, are smaller reservoirs that contain most of our crappie populations in the state. Well, these two yellow bars in our Southwest district are exceptions to that. Harlan Reservoir is this one here. 
and Sherman Reservoir is this one. Now Harlan's crappie population and its abundance is, is related to the last two years of high water at Harlan Reservoir, where we've had a great response to crappie recruitment. Sherman Reservoir, on the other hand, is a traditional good crappie reservoir, probably our best bigger reservoir in the state for crappie year in and year out. And it's it's a, a good crappie lake for two factors. Primarily, it has great cove habitats and the water management scenario at Sherman Reservoir fills that reservoir in April and May every year. So those habitats are all full of water at the right time for spawning and crappie habitat. I'll mention sawguy. I mentioned those earlier. Sawguy is a cross between a sauger and a walleye. They do exhibit uh, benefits from hybrid, hybrid vigor like faster growth, maybe a little more aggressive and easier to catch. And they're showing up at various places across the state where we're, where we're stocking them, including two southwest reservoirs, both Medicine Creek and Red Willow, where we've had trouble with walleye recruitment. These have actually done better than walleye and we're hoping to see some good benefits of those in future years. Before I leave, um, fishing forecast, I'll mention the fish sampling reports we have on our website as well. And these just provide more detailed information on individual locations or reservoirs, lakes or reservoirs. So if you're interested in a Harlan Reservoir, dig into that. This is a copy actually of the site on our website. And you can click on any of these reservoirs. And this is just one of the boxes or, or graphs that you'll see in those reservoirs. It shows the last 10 years of samples at Harlan Reservoir for white bass. And we include most of our major reservoirs in each, or major species in each one of those reservoir summaries. So a great source of information. Certainly encourage, encourage you guys to take a look at it. I'll end with some Nebraska, Nebraska Aquatic Invasive Species information. We do have a program in the state where the last few years we've been mostly educating boaters and public public about aquatic invasive species. We were conducting boater surveys, we're inspecting boats, we're decontaminating boats where necessary. Uh, zebra mussels over here are certainly one of the most prominent aquatic invasive species that we are worried about. Uh, we also do monitoring on a lot of our lakes and reservoirs. In fact, most of our major lakes and reservoirs are monitored annually for the zebra mussel a larvae or bellager form. And so far we haven't found them in most of our reservoirs in the state. Regulations wise, we have done some regulations as, as well. It's, it's illegal to possess any aquatic invasive species, which includes zebra mussels, uh, Asian carp, which I'll talk about in a minute. So it's illegal to, to possess any of those, whether it be in a bucket, uh, your live well, wherever it might be, illegal to possess those. And another big thing we did is, is about lake water. You basically can't arrive or leave a launching area at a lake with lake water in your boat. So clean, drain, and dry is a big important thing we've talked about and you've probably heard in some previous meetings and certainly a good way to keep these things from being spread around. I don't think anybody's in the previous four meetings have shown some of these maps. This is a distribution of zebra mussels and quagga mussels in the state. The zebra in the United States. The zebra mussels are the are the red circles uh, throughout the Midwest. You'll see that they're quite common um, in Nebraska. They're well well established in the Missouri River corridor. We've had some occurrences in some lakes around Omaha, uh, but we've been very lucky. The rest of our state's been zebra mussel free, and I have to contribute that to the efforts our fishermen are making to clean, drain, and dry their boats. Hats off to you guys for keeping those gone and, and not spreading for this long as, at least. So good job. If you look south of us at the state of Kansas, they've got about 30 lakes and reservoirs with established zebra mussel populations in them, which certainly have some impacts that we don't want to see. So as long as we can keep them out of the lakes, the better. We're doing a good job. Asian carp. Asian carp are the silver and big head carp. You've seen, I'm sure, pictures and videos of the silver carp are the ones that jump. Uh, again, both of these species are well established, well established in the Missouri River. 
and they have made their way up the Platte River and certain tributaries of the Platte. Uh, the Elkhorn River has, has uh, Asian carp as well. They've made it up the Loop River Basin to near Burwell, and they've made it up the Platte River Basin to near Lexington. Now, it might be a lucky thing that we have quite a few diversion structures on these tributaries that may prevent these things from moving upstream any farther. And we will certainly look at that as ways to keep them from going farther. With that, the presentation is completed. And I'll list, these are a list of our uh, fisheries management contacts and the three offices I mentioned at the start of the program. And they'll all be available online to help answer questions as we get them. Thanks, Brad. A lot of a lot of great things going on in the Southwest District. Um, at this point, we're going to turn it over to Jordan Cott, who's going to be moderating our question and answer period. And there's been quite a few comments and questions come in in the in the chat box. So he'll uh, he'll start start down that list and and uh, divvy out the questions to the appropriate appropriate folks on the on the meeting here. All right, um, Tony. Let's start start with you and uh, any of the the district guys. If you want to jump in on this as well, talking about wipers and specifically big wipers. Um, how many reservoirs do you guys think contain thirty inch plus uh, wipers right now in uh, both in in Southwest Nebraska and just in the state in general? Tony, I'll let you comment, and then uh, any of the uh, Southwest biologists, if you guys want to want to jump in on that as well. Yeah, the uh, the guys that are out in the field will be closer to the situation because they've probably been handling these fish within the last last couple of years. But obviously, McConaughey with the with the new state record and all the master anglers that have been caught out there recently, Elwood Reservoir has been. Uh, a great fishery for big wipers here recently, um, potentially Harlan, but I don't want to speak out of, uh, um, Brad can probably comment a little bit better on that. And I'll, I'll let the other guys kind of chime in that are a little bit closer to those situations. This is Brad Newcomb again. I'll, I'll make a quick comment on that. Uh, Tony hit the major ones, McConaughey, Elwood, uh, Red Willow have, have been traditionally our source for bigger wipers. Uh, Harlan certainly varies quite a bit. We had some very poor recruitment for quite a few years, but then we did some experimental stocking of fry in 2017 and 18 and had tremendous success. So those year classes will move through the, through the years and down the road, I think we'll see some trophy wiper potential at Harlan as well. So you're right, Tony. And they don't take very long to grow. They grow very fast. Uh, they do quite well in our shad forage base and all of our lakes. So they get to be a big size in a pretty short time. Well, this is Jared Lawrenson. I, uh, in the lakes I'm familiar with in, in Lincoln and Dawson and Gosper counties, um, I would say there's probably three that are fairly likely that 30 inches is pretty elusive. But just a couple of years ago in 2019, we saw a 33 inch or at Sutherland. Um, Elwood, we, we haven't seen a 30 incher ourselves, uh, but we've seen 25s. And I wouldn't be surprised if one shows up in Johnson or another place like that. Thank you guys. All right, Dean, this one is for you. Uh, this one deals with uh, walleye spawn at Lake McConaughey and, Har and uh, Harlan and just uh, when we might be uh, taking eggs and just talk about our general uh, walleye spawn collections uh, this year. Okay. Uh 
start off last year, we had a very limited walleye spawn due to the COVID pandemic. Um, we did do a very abbreviated walleye spawn last year and collected a small number of eggs to provide enough eggs for fingerling production and advanced fingerling production in our hatcheries, but we were not able to provide enough for all the fry stockings in the state. Uh, this year, we do have plans to uh, expand that. Uh, we're probably going to target primarily Merritt Reservoir for our walleye spawn. Uh, most of our walleye spawn will be initiated in that first full week of April. Uh, we'll probably do it in two different three to four day runs if, if possible. We need uh, basically 600 quarts of eggs, which is uh, a fair number, but uh, the guys are pretty good at it. Um, with Merritt Reservoir, we can limit our exposure to the public so we don't expose our crews to uh, additional folks around. Uh, we want to limit access to those areas simply because of the COVID pandemic yet. Um, if we need to, we will finish up at Lake McConaughey. If we do that, we'll probably close off one access point Bay Area to work out of and uh, just do a day or two operation there to finish up if we need to. But we're going to concentrate on Merritt Reservoir and concentrate on using the same folks uh, to do the broodstock collection as well as the spawning would be another crew that does the spawning then. And we can keep those crews separate so we don't expose people to uh, additional risks. Thank you, Dean. Uh, I think Mark Borath is on tonight. This one is dealing with the uh, boat ramp projects and uh, motorized recreation or uh, water trails at Lake McConaughey. Um, if you could talk a little bit about what is being done to ensure that those ramps are going to be usable, uh, specifically the Barton Bay ramp um, at, at varying water levels. And Brad, if you want to touch base on, on uh, a little bit of that as well. Uh, if Mark is not on. I'm on. You okay. can hear me. Yep, there we go. Good. Yeah. Um, McConaughey project is, is kind of unique. Uh, it's part of the overall uh, planning strategy for improving. We're making a lot of improvements at, uh, out of McConaughey over the next three to five to seven years, depending on what it takes to get it done. And one of the things that came up toward the top of the list was to improve boating access at Martin Bay and Cedarview. And so we started putting together some plans on how to best do that. We there were some real obvious ones where you know, repair the some docks and new restrooms and things like that. So we're in the process of doing that. The real challenge there, as, as, as the chat question really identified, is that because of the broad distribution of water levels that happen every year, it's very difficult to have a high quality launching situation at all those different water levels. And so we have a plan in place specifically at Martin Bay where we're gonna to try to target pouring the ramp at the lowest points each year. And we're hoping that with a, a little bit of luck, we can get down a new ramp at a new angle, a more desirable angle. And then hopefully we can push the last hundred and so feet in uh, while there's water there. So our hope is to get to the point where we have got uh, that ramp in service, good condition for the vast majority of water years. All right. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Tony, here's one for you regarding um, what anglers should do, uh, specifically at Lake McConaughey, given some of the research results coming out of there showing that uh, it looks like the majority of that walleye population is coming from uh, from our stockings. Uh, the walleye spawn fishing is very popular out there. What advice do you give to anglers that are out there catching those uh, pre-spawn and spawning uh, fish? Yeah, and I, I 
the question is in regards to harvest, I think, and and yeah, uh, it's perfectly fine to harvest those fish. Um, one of those things that harvest and fishing during the spawn, um, biologically taking taking those fish out of the system, um, it's still a small percentage of the fish. So biologically, we aren't going to be um, impacting that walleye fishery, especially like as uh, Brad mentioned with the the high percentage of fish um, contributing to that system being stocked fish. Uh, thanks, Tony. Uh, this next question has to do with uh, Rock Creek. Uh, Brad, do you or do you want to send this out to Sean? Will trout be restocked out there? Yeah, I'll take that one, Jordan. Um, the plan right now is we're going to hold off trout stockings until March 22. Uh, we want to give the, the panfish and the largemouth bass the opportunity to get established before we start putting uh, advanced fish on top of them. Um, and then we'll, it'll be status quo at that point starting in March 2022. All right. Thanks, Sean. Um, this next question has to do with uh, uh, the uh, water body out there, Mormon East, and anything that is being planned to get uh, access for kayak anglers over to that water body. Yeah, I can answer that one for you, Jordan. Uh, hi, I'm Brad Eifert. I'm a fisheries biologist here in the Carney office. And yeah, Mormon Island East is actually owned by the Department of Transportation, as are several of the other interstate lakes up and down I-80, um, mainly the ones that are located by the, the rest stops and, and at Alda. But it's the Department of Transportation's policy not to allow any boats on their waters. And we've worked with them over the years quite a, on several different occasions trying to get them to allow, you know, non-powered craft and that type of thing, but they haven't really wanted to go that route because of liability issues. And so uh, we we have all those DOT owned interstate lakes currently closed to boats. Um, I guess if you wanted to try to, you know, contact somebody at the Department of Transportation with some letters or phone calls, emails or whatever, that might help. And, uh, but at this point in time, yeah, all of them are closed to boating. All right. Thank you, Brad. Uh, another uh, trout stocking question. Are there any plans to stock uh, or keep trout in French Bend Creek? I'll take that one again, Jordan. Um, at this time, I don't know of any trout in French Bend Creek. Um, with the intermittent flows that we see in French Bend below enders, uh, a lot of times it's a fairly muddy creek. I'm not sure how sustainable trout would be within the Frenchman Creek. Uh, we were able to stock some rainbow trout in Frenchman number one uh, at the Palisade, Palisade Pits last year, um, but those were just a put and, put and take uh, situation where we had extra fish coming out of the Rock Creek hatchery uh, for a little bit different opportunity for anglers in that area. Um, but at this time, they're not part of our long-term plan. If we get extra fish again, we might look at doing that again for anglers. But uh, that's our plan moving forward as far as trout stockings go uh, in that drainage. All right. Thank you. Uh, we got a couple of questions dealing with uh, Lake McConaughey, Lake Ogallala, and the canal system. Um, I believe the uh, canal system right below Lake Ogallala was drawn down, uh, was that last year? What is the uh, trout fishing like in there since that uh, drawdown? I think we got uh, Daryl Eichner on if he wants to, uh, to comment on that. Well, the canal has been dewatered on an annual basis for a period of time here in recent years. Uh, it's a maintenance and repair issue with NPPD and the delivery of water through that canal. Uh, as, as far as the fishery in the canal itself, so much of that hinges on Lake Ogallala because that's where those fish originate from. 
uh, and Lake Ogallala is uh, not quite the trout fishery we want it to be right now. All right. Uh, so here's another one. This is dealing with the uh, with Lake McConaughey and walleye in there. Um, kind of looking at things a little bit different and the number of walleye under 20 inches out there and the difficulty in catching uh, more or less some keepers given our statewide regs. Is there any concern about the number of smaller walleye available to, uh, to anglers in the system? Well, our survey shows that they're there, maybe not in the, the, the dominant numbers we'd like, but they were still there in higher numbers than any of our other uh, Southwest reservoirs. Um, I've always considered McConaughey uh, as a uh, best of both worlds, uh, quality, quality and quantity. And uh, it's uh, from past angler surveys, 70% uh, of the anglers uh, Fish and McConaughey are targeting walleye. So walleye is king here. I would add that if, if anybody has other questions about McConaughey or Lake Ogallala, please uh, don't be afraid to call me. I'd be glad to visit with you. Yeah, for sure. Every, you can see everybody's uh, contact info is up there. Everybody, all of our biologists like to uh, to visit with with any of our anglers out there. Um, this next question deals with uh, Johnson Lake. Uh, Jared, could you just talk about uh, the Johnson Lake fishery and any any limitations that it, it uh, might have to keep it from being a, a great fishery? Yeah, thank you, Jordan. Uh, well, <laughs> I, I tend to disagree a little bit. I think Johnson is a pretty good fishery uh, in most regards, but it could be better. I agree there. Things could always be better. Um, you know, it's a 2,100 acre lake that receives a lot of pressure. Um, and that's probably one of the biggest things really limiting it. Um, and, you know, water quantity. Um, how often does the water go up and down really in that lake? All right. Thanks, Jared. Um, I'm going to throw this one up to any of our biologists that are on. Um, saw guys, as are anybody might know, are hybrids between sauger and walleye. Does anybody care to comment on what their potential spawning behavior might be? Do they come into the rocks? Um, similar to what a walleye might do for somebody that might be uh, looking to target them this spring, similar to what uh, what they do for uh, for the walleye spawn. I think Daryl Bauer's on. Maybe I'll I'll put Bauer on the spot. Sorry, Daryl. No, I'm awake. <laughs> um, saw guy are hybrids, but they are uh, capable of reproduction with both parent species or with another saw guy. So they definitely do spawn. They definitely go through the spawning motions. Now, whether they do more of the spawning habits that sauger do or walleye do, um, your guess is good as mine. They're hybrids. So probably somewhere between the two or depending on which parent species they might be spawning with. All right. Thanks, Daryl. All right, Brad Newcomb, this is a, a question uh, regarding the white bass explosion at Harlan uh, recently. Let you uh, talk about that a little bit. Uh, compared to uh, the numbers that were down there in 2018 and 19 compared to uh, what you guys saw in 2020. Okay, to start with, white bass are a schooling species and our nets 
don't always catch them in their abundance. I can tell you that. Um, sometimes we miss them. Sometimes we really get them. So white bass net catches typically fluctuate more than other species because of their schooling nature. Um, the big pulse in 2020, no doubt, is a result of high water levels. Harlan Reservoir went over full pool by about seven, eight feet in 2019 to its record high level. And it's been high pretty much since then. So we've had great habitat for a lot of species to naturally reproduce and recruit. And I'm sure that's what we're looking at with white bass as well as the crappie, which I showed in that one slide as well. So um, yeah, luckily we got a huge year class um, basically the, huge, the biggest year class we've ever sampled anywhere that I've ever seen in the state. So it, it's kind of in record categories and we'll see what it does, but I expect some super fish in the next few years. All right. Thanks, Brad. Uh, Tony, I'm going to send this next one to you. This deals with bass tournaments on McConaughey. Um, I don't think we have data from 2020 in front of us, but I, I think uh, you might have some information from 2019 if you um, care to share any of that with the group. Yeah, just uh, what was compiled by a group of our biologists looking at, looking at tournaments. Um, there were eight bass tournaments in 2019. And so if, um, if Daryl Eichner has a indication on whether he thinks that number continues to rise because of the, the uh, kind of increase in, in smallmouth fishing out there. He might have some other, other trends that he could share. Well, in, in recent years, we've had six or eight bass tournaments on McConaughey where it wasn't too long ago, maybe we had three. So there is definitely more interest in the smallmouth uh, at McConaughey and then I was really surprised by the number of master angler award uh, smallmouth these last two three years actually uh, pleasant surprise all right thanks guys Um, this one deals with the um, rainbow trout in the Platte River below Lake Ogallala. Any advice on what a fly fisherman should be using down there to uh, have have some better success? Uh, there, there's a number of fly patterns that'll work. Everything from woolly burger to smaller uh, bloodworm patterns. Uh, there's a number, and and whether it's Lake Ogallala or uh, the river. My uh, experience has been I've seen very few fly anglers having success with uh, dry flies. It's usually all uh, uh, streamers, uh, wet flies. Um, occasionally somebody will have a little success with dry flies, but not very many. And, and to continue on, uh, the, the success in the river, the trout fishery there, is directly correlated to the fishery in the lake because that's where the majority of those fish are going to come from into the canal or the river. They're going to come from the lake. And we've renovated Lake Ogallala three times uh, over in history, uh, 1969, 97, and most recently in 2009. And it's uh, the reason for those renovations is to knock back the uh, carp and white sucker numbers. Uh, Lake Ogallala is a phenomenal trout fishery when everything's right. There's just a very abundant number of aquatic invertebrates and those trout show some uh, tremendous growth uh, rates in uh, Lake Ogallala and uh, the canal, the river. It's, uh, it's a package deal with that, that trout fishery down there. Thanks, Daryl. Uh, back to Lake McConaughey. Um, Daryl and or Tony, if you guys want to want to look at this or, or uh, nuke them, if you want to 
want to jump in on this as well with the um, number of walleye that we're stocking in there and uh, typical survival rate is, is that sustainable for a healthy walleye population with our rising fishing pressure that we're seeing? You guys want to jump in on your, your thoughts on that? Well, I guess I'll. Yeah. Yeah, go, go ahead, ahead Daryl. Uh, our normal annual request for walleye stockings in McConaughey is a one and a half million. Now, there are some years we have bonus uh, numbers available in, in, uh, that exceed that million and a half. Occasionally, there might be a year where uh, production at the hatchery uh, was not quite as good, so we might not get that million and a half. But, more often than not, we will get more than a million and a half. Uh, you make a request for a million and a half fingerlings, that ties up a few ponds, more than a few ponds at our hatchery in our hatchery system. And then you add to that any stocking requests for uh, white bass, wipers. Uh, it puts a, a load on our hatchery system. That million and a half has been a, a standard for a period of years, for quite a period of years. I'll add a little bit to that, Jordan. Um, like Daryl said, we're stocking 50 per acre, which is about a standard rate across the state. Um, we closely monitor that walleye population. If we see recruitment starting to slide or not produce enough fish, we'll make adjustments. And that's pretty much with all of our lakes. We, we annually survey most of these big reservoirs. Uh, we look at young of the year, uh, survival and success. And if we see major changes to recruitment, we'll make adjustments as needed. Uh, so kind of jumping on with this uh, McConaughey walleye information, do we have harvest information there um, to help with our, our survey numbers? Uh, can you talk about our, our creel status? That, that might be a good uh, question for Tony to, to talk about. Yeah, we... We had pretty consistent creel surveys or an angler harvest and catch information uh, up until, oh, I think it was about three years ago, where some of our focus of our creel surveys were shifted to some other water bodies to help us gain some more information and guide management elsewhere. Um, however, we will, be, we will be shifting some of that focus back uh, sometime here in the near future. Um, so here within the last three or so years, and, and Daryl Eichner could probably give me the exact year of when we when we ceased surveys there and, and went elsewhere, but um, we'll get back there and, and continue to monitor that, knowing knowing what, what harvest and catch um, and the trends in that are going on at each of our water bodies is very important. Um, however, keep in mind, just like kind of with uh, what Daryl was talking about with with hatchery space and 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 um, and funding and that sort of thing, creel surveys and these these surveys to collect this information are are very expensive. So we have to uh, prioritize where we collect this information. Yeah, and so another um, just follow up to that, um, Brad, you kind of touched on it a little bit, just about the decision process of how many fish, how many walleye to stock. It, is it a standard 50 per acre? Do you guys make adjustments uh, annually on that based on your survey results or do you keep that pretty consistent at, at 50 per acre. And does, I guess, 
um, does water level play into that as well? We try to keep that consistent. Uh, like I mentioned in my presentation, we have done research and experiments on stocking rates, determine which one works the best. 50 has been a pretty consistent and, and good stocking rate per surface acre for fingerlings. Um, we don't normally change that annually. Uh, if we saw a trend over multiple years, we'd probably look at changes, either stocking a different size, different rate, um, all those factors would be considered. So it's not a thing we do on an annual basis very often, but if we do see a trend one way or the other, uh, we will make adjustments as needed. All right, thanks. Thanks, Brad. Um, Dean, I'm gonna addre address this one to you, talking about um, hatcheries and where our walleye are raised. Uh, the question asked specifically for the fry, but maybe talk about uh, where our fingerlings and advanced fingerlings are raised as well. Yeah, uh, our walleye production numbers are are pretty extensive compared to a lot of our other species. So they take up a lot of space, uh, both in the hatching of them and also in the rearing. So all the, all the walleye in the state are raised at Calamus and North Platte hatcheries. Uh, we raise at both locations. And uh, so like Lake McConaughey, we'll get fingerlings from Calamus and North Platte. Uh, we spread it out. We try and, and raise those fish in a close proximity to where we're going to stock them uh, to minimize our stocking trips. So, and they take a lot of ponds and we can't put everything in one facility. So it's spread out. And same way with hatching on the hatching batteries. We, we've only got so much tank space for our fry. We have to stock them in that three to five day range uh, to have survival. So uh, that's kind of what we do with our walleye. All right, thanks, uh, thanks, Dean. So here's here's a question regarding um, Gremlin Cove at Harlan and uh, difficulty getting in and out of there using a boat, um, specifically up at the ramp. Um, any plans to make any improvements in there? I can take that one, Jordan. Um, we did a pretty major access improvement project at Methodist Cove boat ramp, oh, I'm going to say 15 years ago. Uh, the two jetties were added to protect that ramp from waves. It was dug out some, so there is pretty adequate depth at, at most elevations. Now, it's an irrigation reservoir, and when it gets low enough, uh, that site and several others become unusable. And yeah, if it's a popular enough site, if there's not other sites to use, it can be looked at for more improvements and more dredging. And I think it's on the Corps of Engineers list to do dredging as needed uh, when, lakes, when the lake's lower. So it's an ongoing thing. It's typical of irrigation reservoirs. When they get low enough, sites become unusable. Uh, the Hunter Cove boat ramp at Harlan Reservoir becomes usable in about a three foot drawdown. So luckily Methodist is good till about a 15, 20 foot drawdown. And even if it gets that low, then we have to look at other options. But um, as far as I know, core dredging is, is the typical maintenance used at that site so far. Thanks, Brad. Uh, this is something that was discussed at some of our other meetings. Daryl uh, Eichner, this um, is regarding the Lake McConaughey strain of rainbow trout and stocking those in streams west of, uh, of the lake. Do you or I guess anybody else on the call know uh, the status of that, uh, of that project that's going on? That would actually be a, more of a question for Al Hansen up at Alliance if he's on. Um, 
as far as the McConaughey strain and the reservoir itself, the uh, uh, migratory uh, quality of those fish moving from McConaughey up into those panhandle streams made them very attractive. However, Lake McConaughey is an aging reservoir and uh, as time has gone on, uh, you, you, for these trout to survive in McConaughey, they need some thermal cooler water refuge. And as McConaughey is aged, the availability of that cold, cool water with enough oxygen diminishes, especially the lower the lake level gets. So in so many years, uh, it can be a tough environment out there for summer survival of any trout in McConaughey. We still have a few. They occasionally show up in our surveys, uh, but not many. And if Al wants to chime in. Yeah, I, I'm not sure if Al is on. Uh, oh yeah, there's Al. Yeah, was that like uh, looking for an introduction to McConaughey's west of us you know, up in the valley? Was that the question? Yeah, just talk about the project of yeah reintroducing them to those those streams out west there. Yeah, there there was a um, reserved strain sent to Annis, Montana years ago when we were uh, dwindling on our run, and there's a private group that has asked our permission to put them in about five different streams and egg boxes in the North Platte Valley. I won't name all the streams, but anyway, this is I think year seven, but year six for sure, and. We haven't seen a return of them yet, and they're supposed to return on uh, year three. So, like Daryl said, there's a lot of issues in the lake. The plankton, you know, used to be one and a half to two millimeters, and that's what they'd start growing on. We've got a world-class predator population down there, and we also had uh, seven years of probably no trout support and water in there too. So, there's a lot of reasons. We're still waiting to see if we get some results on the on return on them. We, we also went out and collected a whole bunch of DNA too. Uh, Thad Huneman and uh, Lincoln has that. He's just, we still haven't got the results on it. So we've been in all the streams that we stocked them in just to see what the rainbows are in there. So there's a lot to um, be found out about this yet. All right, thanks guys. Um, Jared, this one deals with the um the fish kill at Lake Maloney a couple of years ago that uh, impacted the white bass and wipers. Uh, can you talk about that and if it impacted any of the other uh, fish species out there? And uh, just talk about how the overall fishery at Lake Maloney has uh, is doing and if it's recovered from that uh, that fish kill. Yeah, well, on Memorial weekend of 2018, there was a fish kill and it was widely publicized. Uh, we think, you know, it was at least a few thousand white bass died. And inspections found some other species that may have been that were dead, but they were obvious bow fishing uh, kills. Um, I really think it was just a case of the last straw. Um, these white bass were up in the inlet um, and we sent a couple of them off to get inspected for any health diseases and none were found. So I think it was a last straw kind of thing. These fish were up in that inlet in a prolonged state of trying to spawn and a glug of some kind of water quality parameter came through that was disagreeable to them and it was just the last straw. We do not believe that other species were affected by that kill. Um, coincidentally, that year, um, walleye stockings were doubled before this happened. Um, my predecessor had it at a rate and coincidentally, we doubled it that year. Um, and maybe that wasn't, isn't the best for that lake at this time, but uh, that's where we're at with that. Um, white bass haven't recovered and it is it is an internal discussion that we're having. Um, these lakes are connected, you know, all the way down from McConaughey. Sutherland, their numbers of white bass are better. Um, so maybe they're, they're coming. Um, it is a drawdown year this year. Um, anyhow, <laughs> you got to see the good uh, 
through the bad sometimes. Thanks, Jared. Um, this one deals with back to Lake McConaughey walleye and natural reproduction there. Uh, Daryl Eichner, uh, Newcomb, and I know we also have our, our uh, research biologist, Keith Copel on, who's done, done some pretty extensive work out there on this as well. Why do you guys think uh, natural reproduction, or I'll rephrase it as natural recruitment, is uh, is fairly poor out at Lake McConaughey. I'll start that one off. Uh, it's no doubt a direct result of uh, alewife that were introduced. Uh, if you go back into the uh, late 70s, we had a forage collapse uh, at Lake McConaughey, and a decision was made to put some research effort into uh, some uh, getting some background. And ultimately what happened was we tried three or four different species of forage uh, to supplement what was primarily all gizzard shad based uh, forage base. Uh, none of those worked with the exception of alewife. Now the fisheries literature will tell you that alewife are a very, very efficient filter feeder. And what they did was they knocked back, trimmed down the uh, large zooplankton that used to exist in McConaughey pre alewife. Now these, uh, were, for example, were a Daphnia species, Daphnia pulex, and these uh, zooplankton uh, had uh, some size, very large size, two, two and a half millimeters. Uh, the alewife were responsible for knocking back those numbers. They were replaced by uh, Bosmina and Copepod. Uh, when we stock Lake McConaughey, uh, well, let me finish on the on the, the, the alewife. The literature also indicates that they are pecivorous and uh, predatory and uh, can utilize prey species up to one inch in length. Uh, that's why we stock fingerling, not advanced fingerling, but fingerling walleye rather than fry. I don't think we have the large zooplankters out there uh, for the survivability on uh, a fry stocking. And then you have, you factor in what could be that predatory nature of alewife on uh, walleye fry, white bass fry, whatever. They uh, no doubt impacted uh, double-edged sword. They uh, impacted our natural recruitment. Thanks, Daryl. Um, sticking with uh, Lake McConaughey, the white bass and uh, wiper numbers seem to uh, be on the uptick out there. Are the densities of those two species considered when stocking uh, fingerling walleye? We uh stock uh, request, uh, request is made for around 400,000 uh, white bass. Uh, the request for uh, wipers is uh, 70, 75,000. Now like walleye, we have had some bonus production in the, the hatchery system uh, with the wiper. We've uh, exceeded that uh, request number uh, several times. Um, the, uh, the white bass, uh, uh, We've, we've tried, I've always tried to, uh, when a, a truck comes to McConaughey with a load of fish, there's three to four tanks on a truck. And rather than dump the entire truck load at one location, now we have to use a boat ramp, concrete ramp, uh, hatchery trucks and beach sand don't go well together. Um, so, but I do have tr always tried to uh, dump one tank full at one boat ramp, uh, say down along the north side where the majority of the concrete ramps are, but uh, drop those fish in two or three locations uh, per truckload. Uh, with the research people that have been involved on McConaughey now, um, there's uh, concern that there's uh, maybe some uh, high predation 
on fingerling stockings by uh, other game fish. Uh, smallmouth bass are notorious from what they've found uh, to this point, but also the wiper, the white bass, uh, walleye are predatory on these uh, uh, fingerling that we're stocking. And then allow the last several years, we are, uh, rather than stocking from the shoreline, we're stocking by boat, offloading from the truck onto tanks on a pontoon boat and getting them away from the shoreline where we release them. And hopefully we can fine tune uh, some of the success uh, from these stockings. So Daryl, you kind of hit on moving those stockings away from uh, the shoreline. One of our uh, biologists did uh, their graduate work kind of looking at this. Sean, do you care to talk about uh, smallmouth bass predation on those walleye stockings and uh, kind of some of the stuff that you found? Yeah, Daryl Darryl hit it pretty well there, Jordan. Um, so the, the primary concern with the smallmouth is they're very habitat specific within McConaughey. Um, they prefer those rocky shores, especially on the southeast corner. Um, and then we see them quite often right around our boat ramps because we move rock in to stabilize those areas where we build those ramps. And as Daryl touched on, that's one species that we identified that we know where they're at and we know we can avoid them. And we know that we've maybe been dumping fish on top of them in the past. So with going to this boat stocking strategy, we're hoping that if we can get away from some of those, we might be able to increase our efficiency a little bit which could open up the opportunity to raise more fish in the hatcheries. Um, I know I've seen a few questions come across the chat about the capacity in the hatcheries. Well, if we can get more efficient with what we're doing, see a higher return on these stockfish, it's only gonna benefit McConaughey and maybe the rest of the, the lakes that are requesting fish as well. All right, thanks, Sean. Um, Dean, I'm going to give this one to you. This is in regards to, uh, the spear fishing walleye limit at Lake McConaughey is set at four. And, uh, could you just touch base on how those limits came to be? Thanks, Jordan. Uh, there was a study done a number of years ago, and I don't remember the exact date on it, um, uh, on spearfishing uh, in Lake McConaughey and a lot of the reservoirs. And that was done probably seven, eight years ago, I think. Brad, do you remember about how long ago that was? Um, and there's always been contention between uh, our hook and line anglers and the spearfish anglers. Uh, and that's something that, you know, it's hard to regulate uh, the spearfish anglers because out of sight, out of mind, if, so to speak. And, but for the most part, I think that most of them follow the rules and do what's right. But uh, there was this, like I said, there was a study done a number of years ago and that's how the limits were set on that. And I could dig that study up if the person's interested. All right. Thanks, Dean. Uh, kind of moving away from McConaughey here for a little bit. Uh, this one shifts over to uh, to Elwood, and I know Brad, you touched a little bit about the water levels there during your presentation. Uh, with those water levels being so far down, um, how do you see that as impacting the uh, both the fishing and the overall fishery there? I can take a stab at that, Jerry, if you want me to. Um, I fish that reservoir quite a bit myself, so I have some personal experience as well. 
as what I hear from anglers. Um, a normal drawdown on that lake for irrigation is in that 10 to 20 foot range or even farther. So it's not unusual to see that kind of drawdown. So long-term impacts of the fishery with that kind of drawdown, I don't see a lot of that. Uh, we had a, about a five year period where that reservoir was down about 40 feet and we did have some impacts, but that was under a, a drought period with no inflows to hell with. Um, being down in the, in the 10 to 20 foot range does affect fishing success. Uh, I'd say myself and most others fishing normal shorelines last year did uh, more, did not as well as we have in the past. We, we didn't have quite the success. It was a little tougher fishing. Whereas the people on the dam that fish at night, I uh, didn't see much of a drop in their fishing success. So it kind of depends on where, the re where on the reservoir you fish, what habitats you fish. Uh, but in general, I don't see a huge impact to the fishery, uh, hardly any impact to the fishery, and, and some impact to fishing certain bank lines. That's about it. All right. Thanks, Brad. Um, back to uh, fishing the Platte River below Lake Ogallala. Um, do most of the fishermen down there, are they fishing off the weirs or are they uh, wading in the, in the river? The majority are gonna be fishing off the weirs, uh, literally. Um, I made an observation last fall, uh, late November, uh, and, and it is a very popular area to, to fish in the winter months. Uh, there's usually a lower flow and we've, uh, had discussions with MPPD about a, uh, at least a minimum flow during the winter months to uh, preserve the fishery that does exist in those weirs. Um, the uh, public area to fish extends about 3,000 uh, feet below the third weir. Anything below that, you're on private land. But uh, the first three weirs and then that distance of 3,000 feet, you're on MPPD uh, property. Uh, there was a number of cormorant and pelican in there uh, last fall, late fall. And uh, I actually went down with uh, shell crackers and a 12 gauge shotgun trying to spook those out of there uh, to hopefully preserve a few fish for the anglers. And I failed. I could not move those birds off that uh, off the water with uh, shell crackers and uh, they might be responsible for some of the poor fishing success right now. Uh, thanks, Daryl. Uh, this next one has to do with some AIS related stuff. Uh, I th think uh, our AIS coordinator, Chris Starr is going to be on here if, uh, if he's still on. Otherwise, I think Tony could handle this as well. On the maps that Brad showed during the presentation, uh, zebra and quagga mussels, Asian carp, they kind of peter out in the mid-continent. Can you just kind of talk about why that might be? Uh, is that just as far as, as they've spread and have they continued to spread farther west? Hi, yeah, um, my name is Chris Starr, I'm the Aquatic Invasive Species Program Manager for Greenland Parks. Um, and, and yeah, you're right. Um, that's so far, um, how far they've spread so far. So, um, you know, like Brad talked about, um, we do efforts every year to do inspections on boats and also have a lot of projects um, right now for research to find out where our Asian carp are um, um, as well. So yeah, we're doing efforts right now to control the spread, but that is how far they've been at now. But yeah, the best thing that guys can do and boaters can do and anglers can do is to clean, drain, dry their boat. So um, especially uh, for Asian carp as well, you know, when you're sitting your own bait, you know, to not mistake them for gizzard shad. Um, Asian carp, uh, their eyeball is very, very low on the head, almost down below the, uh, the mouth. So that's one way to identify that. So that's one thing that we ask our anglers to do. And, um, compared to other states, Nebraska is very, very fortunate compared to Kansas, 
um, like Brad said, and some of our surrounding states. And that's really a testament to our anglers and boaters that are, they're doing these clean, dry, and dry uh, procedures. So we just wanna make sure that we keep doing those and stay vigilant, you know, so we keep our waters that we all enjoy, you know, invasive free. So, and, and if you have any more, you know, questions, you know, you can contact Game Parks at ngpc.ais at nebraska.gov, so. Thanks, Chris. Um, Tony, you might know this one a little bit. Uh, Brad, you may as well. Uh, dealing with some of our native species, any American eel that way out that way. And I guess any efforts to restore these uh, populations. I'll speak for the Southwest District. Um, been here about 30 years and don't think I've ever seen one or heard of one being caught or observed in this district. Um, pretty well contained in the Missouri River. And the most common place I've seen those in the past is below Gavin's Point Dam. Tony, I don't yeah. know if you have more observations yeah. or not. No, Brad, you you uh, took the words out of my mouth. That's below Gavin's Point Dam is kind of the only only place that, in my recollection, that they've been collected in the um, in the recent history. Um, Jeff Shuckman may be on uh, in the Northeast District, and Dean may have a uh, may a comment as well. Yeah, th this is Dean. Um, the lower plat occasionally anglers will catch eel american eel in the lower plat as uh, far up as Louisville area um, i know personally that have been caught up in that area they can go further but for the most part that's probably about as far as they get maybe maybe they get a little further west but not a lot hey tony uh you guys are right. The, the eel below Gavin's Point Dam, the American eel, are actually somewhat common. We see some up there just about every time we electrofish. So they're kind of a neat critter to see. Hard to get in the net. They'll go through some bigger mesh nets because they're more like a snake than anything else. But uh, they're, they're quite common up there. We see them all the time from little ones to big ones. They're, they're really kind of amazing creature when you, when you do see them because they're they're unique to many people and they're unique to us, but we do see them quite a bit. Thanks guys. Uh, back to Lake Ogallala. I know uh, Daryl Eichner, you mentioned about uh, it not being where we want it to be currently for um, to produce the, the trout. Are there any plans right now to renovate Lake Ogallala? All I can say it's being discussed, but nothing definitive. Um, ideally from where I'm sitting, um, well, I, I mentioned we've renovated those three different times. Ideally, we'd like to get, it's very expensive. It gets complicated. It gets involved uh, pulling off that renovation. You, you need to work and coordinate with two irrigation districts. Uh, cost of road known is very expensive. Ideally, we would like to get 10 years benefit out of one renovation. In the last two, we've got maybe five or six years benefit uh, as far as uh, the, the quality growth and size of those rainbow trout. Um, ideally, I'd like to see some of our research effort on Lake Ogallala to look at possibly what could be done to keep those carp and white sucker numbers in check somewhat. And then there's a continual issue with uh, dissolved oxygen related to the Kingsley Hydro. Uh, we've had, uh, not every year, but some random years where we have a summer die off, low oxygen related. Uh, a couple of things that need to be looked at and uh, see if uh, changes could be made. I, I overuse this all the time, but Lake Ogallala is a 12 month a year fishery that Lake McConaughey is not. Even in the winter and ice cap periods, there's enough uh, shoreline bank seepage where there's open water, bank anglers can still uh, 
fish. Uh, there's, of course, ice that you can uh, ice fish on. Uh, north end of Lake Ogallala has some open water. Uh, there's usually some open water in front of the canal gates, the diversion dam gates uh, for anglers. And then you add the river and the canal, those are winter uh, fisheries also. And uh, compared to McConaughey, uh, the ice fishing is uh, very, success is very, very limited, very limited. And again, I overuse this, Lake Ogallala is a 12 month a year fishery that Lake McConaughey is not. Thanks, Daryl. Uh, back to Lake McConaughey walleye. How long on average does it take one of the uh, walleye to reach 15 inches out there at uh, McConaughey? Two to three years. Uh, there's very, they don't all uh, come out of a cookie cutter and, and have the same growth rates, but um, two to three years is in that range. Uh, so there, there's been a fair amount of discussion regarding the stocking numbers back there or out there at Lake McConaughey. Um, Tony and or Dean, if you just could touch base on, I know we, we've uh, discussed it uh, fairly in depth on why we're stocking what we're, we are at at McConaughey, but just kind of touch base on how, if we were to stock more at McConaughey, how that would kind of affect just the entire statewide walleye production system. Yeah, we we definitely realize, or, or we, we're, folks are very passionate about uh, Lake McConaughey specifically um, because of the fishery it has been and, and continues to be. So these comments are, are, uh, are are great and we love that people are very interested. But like Jordan was stating, um, we have a lot of water bodies across the state that uh, rely heavily on stocking. We have some, some waters that have some natural recruitment and, and do fairly well. Most of our others, we have a lot of water bodies in this state or are, uh, there's some degraded habitat, some other issues with natural reproduction and recruitment. and. Um, our hatchery system and our, our production guys are, are, are hard at it as hard as they could ever be to uh, produce as many walleye as we can. So it's, it's prioritization. Um, we're, we're pumping out fish like mad. Um, and we're really proud of those efforts by, by our production staff. Yeah, I'll add in on that too. I saw one comment to where, you know, it, it referred to the money we're spending on the boat ramp versus we can't raise them in the hatchery. We're limited on pond space and water on, you know, most of our facilities. Uh, we're locked into the square footage of property we have in some cases uh, or the amount of water available. So we can't just throw more money at it and, and raise more. It, that's not an option. However, we do, we have been experimenting with increasing the number of fry we stock into a hatchery pond to increase our, our return. We're also experimenting with intensive culture uh, on some of our species to free up pond space. Uh, we're looking uh, some of our marginal, not marginal species, but species where the numbers aren't large, we try and do those intensively inside, at least for a portion of the time, uh, to free up pond space. So we're not tying up pond space with those. We did a number of experiments, uh, probably about 25 to, probably about 25 years ago uh, on different stocking rates for fry in a hatchery pond to get where we could get our best return of an adequate size fry, a fingerling back out. And we keep bumping that up a little bit as we can and uh, to kind of tweak that number to get as much return as we can out of those ponds. And we'll continue to do that. Uh, 
We tax our hatchery staff pretty hard to increase production and uh, they've been pretty good at it and uh, probably some of the tops in the nation in my opinion, but uh, they, they will continue to work at those numbers and we'll continue to try and produce more with what we have. We're always trying to make improvements. Thanks guys. Um, this is also dealing with uh, Lake McConaughey. So we've kind of talked about smallmouth bass and um, uh, alewives in dealing with stocking walleye there. Uh, what about uh, crappie? Would that also be a detriment, not only just for uh, predation, but also um, Competition-wise, Sean and or Daryl Eichner, you guys care to uh, address that? I'll go first and let Sean chime in if he wants. Uh, Lake McConaughey hit a new record low back in uh, 2006. Uh, we lost 80% uh, of the volume. Uh, it stair-stepped down to 2006, uh, but and then stair-stepped up gradually. Uh, during that low drawdown, uh, there was a lot of terrestrial vegetation that established on the, the exposed lake bed. A request was made, well, let me finish. It stair-stepped back up going up to uh, 2010. And in 2010, we gained 8,000 surface acres of water. We had a tremendous inflow in the North Platte River. We got within five feet of our uh, normal full pool we gained that remaining five feet in 2011. Uh, with all that flooded brush, uh, a request was made for crappie, black and, and white crappie both. Um, with the uh, Lincoln okay on that, that stocking request, the mandate was that uh, there would need to be follow-up sampling uh, to evaluate the success of that, those crappie stockings. We did uh, three years. Um, what? we found from our frame netting, uh, we, saw, we saw more bluegill and, than uh, crappie and we didn't stock any bluegill. Uh, the uh, crappie just did not take and provide that fishery that existed back in the uh, 40s when the reservoir was new. Uh, but we did make an effort, uh, it did not work out. Uh, I, one other thought comes to mind. A result of all that flooded vegetation, we did have a yellow perch fishery and we did not stock yellow perch, but there were enough uh, brood fish out there and they took advantage of those uh, that flooded brush. And we actually had, according to our creel, it was done back in that era. Uh, we had fishermen uh, going out on the water and targeting yellow perch and being successful catching those, uh, that, those perch. Uh, their numbers faded with time. Um, there, there was one other uh, bad element. We, we gained 8,000 acre surface acres in 2010, uh, got up to full pool in 2011. In 2012, we lost 8,000 acres because of poor inflows and high irrigation demand downstream. So uh, we uh, benefited for a few years and there's still a, a, a lot of flooded timber and brush out there. Um, if There's been a lot of questions on McConaughey. Uh, you know, I'm more than willing to uh, visit with anybody. If you pulled my number off the, that screen at 284-8803, I'm glad to visit with anybody. I got an answering machine here. If I don't pick up, leave a message. But my biggest concern with the future of the McConaughey fishery is water levels. We had that new record low back in 2006. Um, I'm pretty sure it's gonna happen again. I don't know when, but it's gonna happen again. And how we avoided a cataclysmic fish die off when you lose so much as a high percentage of the volume and surface acres from 30,000 surface acres to uh, 14,000 surface acres. 
can have quite an impact on a fishery and how we didn't have a cataclysmic fish die off. Uh, I think we really dodged a bullet and I'm apprehensive about the future when it comes to water levels. Sean, you want to? Daryl did, did a pretty good job covering that. Uh, one thing that I do want to touch on, so with the research that I did um, and that we've done evaluating the stockings, the walleye stockings at McConaughey have been hugely successful. Um, the 89 to 100% stock contribution is unheard of. Um, to have that type of success rate. All we're doing is looking at ways to be more efficient um, with, what it, with what we're doing. Really what the research kind of stemmed from is we were looking at the white bass populations. We had um, the nature of a white bass fishery. Uh, they're very boomer bust. So without high inflows, we don't see the recruitment that we would on years when we do have the high inflows, kind of like Brad touched on uh, at Harlan, we have those high inflows and you see a big spike in the white bass numbers. So what we're really looking at is the white bass as a secondary to that project, we're able to evaluate some of the walleye stockings. And we're just hoping to maybe make this more efficient to free up some space within the hatchery. But as far as big sweeping changes, there isn't really a need because if you look at uh, the fishing forecast on our website, McConaughey is still right at the top in, the, in Nebraska and even in the Midwest as far as large fish, good fish coming in behind them for the walleye populations. So the, the future of the walleye fishery in McConaughey is strong and will continue to be strong uh, with what Daryl's done over his career and what we plan to do moving into the future too. All right, thanks, Sean. Um, we're gonna do one last question here before we wrap things up for the night. Uh, Sean, can you just briefly uh, give an outlook on what the fishing is going to be like down at Rock Creek Lake this summer? So fishing at Rock Creek this summer uh, will still be pretty limited. Um, we, we've stocked it with yellow perch and black crappie last fall um, and some three inch fingerling largemouth as well. Um, we have more stockings planned for this fall, and we are planning on moving some adult uh, red ear sunfish and largemouth bass in there as well. Um, looking at the data from our last renovation in the early 2000s, it was about year three when you started to see the, that fishery really take off. Um, but it's still a nice place to go camp, and they do tours down there at the hatchery. Um, so there's still plenty of opportunity for people to want to go down there and visit the lake and uh, see the improved water quality that we're already seeing uh, now that we don't have gizzard shad uh, in the whole drainage. All right, thanks, Sean. And with that, um, we're gonna end the Q&A session here. Uh, if anybody still has questions, uh, please reach out to our biologists, our Lincoln staff, um, anybody that you would like to discuss any of these uh, topics with, um, contact info was put up on the screen, uh, can be found in the fishing guide. These uh, presentations are all going to be uploaded on our YouTube channel that you can find links to on our fishing page. Uh, so yeah, please, please reach out and uh, discuss further if you feel so inclined. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to uh, Tony and Dean to uh, wrap up tonight. Yeah, thanks a lot, Jordan. Um, and and we just really appreciate this this sort of session, all the comments, the the discussion, the questions coming in. Passionate group of people, um, and we're uh, we just want to. We just want to thank you because this is this is the type of information that we need and we want and we really appreciate. Um, also, want to recognize uh, a lot of the other folks on the call here from our from our agency, uh, from our different divisions within wildlife, parks, law enforcement, and other divisions. Um, uh, can't say it enough. We we rely on those uh, those collaborations within our agency to really. Um, 
do what we do within the fisheries division. So thanks guys. And I'll just kind of echo that too. We really appreciate uh, the cooperation we have and, and we're able to work well with our wildlife division, our law enforcement, our parks communications. I saw Julie Geyser's name on here. She's been on for the last couple of nights. Uh, really appreciate all that they do and uh, really appreciate the people for joining us tonight, the great questions. We had some really good questions. Uh, we'll continue to go through these questions and look at them. Uh, hopefully we can provide the information that you guys are looking for. And we'll be continuing to discuss some of these things uh, as we move forward. As you noted, as I noted at the very beginning, we have a couple of our commissioners. I think there were three of them on board here tonight. Uh, and I'm sure I will be discussing with them some of the questions as we move forward. So thank you, everybody. Uh, have a good evening. Uh, we really appreciate your, your time and your interest here. Thank you. Good night.